Without my students, who would I be? I mean, you can't be much of a teacher if you don't have students. Hello, everyone. It's episode 82 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Michael Rowe. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick. And I'm also your host for Martial Arts Radio. Whistlekick, as so many of you know already, makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as really great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of the traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank everyone coming back. If you're not familiar with our products, you should take a look at what we make. When it comes to comfortable sparring gear, that's something we do really well, especially with our sparring helmet. It's more ventilated, more flexible, and lasts a lot longer than the stuff our competition makes. So go have a look at whistlekick.com. Now, if you want to see the show notes for this episode or any of our past episodes, that's all on a different website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to everyone that subscribes, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only send out a few a month, so don't worry about us spamming you. You don't have to worry about us selling your information. And sometimes we even throw in a coupon for you. So check that out. As you know, we periodically check out the reviews people leave for us. And today's comes from BMC1128 on iTunes. And it says, awesome podcast. Great guests with inspiring stories. Great job by the host. Thank you very much. And I'm a big fan of the Thursday shows too. Thanks for putting it together. Well, thank you for leaving that review. And of course, we appreciate all of you that leave reviews. Go ahead, check it out. And remember, if we read yours on the air, just shoot us an email, info at whistlekick.com, and we can coordinate getting you some free stuff as a thank you. Now, today's episode is with Mr. Michael Rowe. And he's a martial artist with about as diverse a training history as anyone I've ever seen with experience in karate, ninjutsu, taekwondo, hapkido, and a whole bunch more, and all that under a, a lot of different martial arts instructors, Mr. Rowe really brings a lot to the table. He's an insightful man, and his stories are wonderful. They're entertaining, they're honest, and they're real. So sit back, and let's hear from today's guest. Mr. Rowe, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, welcome to you too. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here. This is going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, we were just chatting before the episode started. And I, 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 I've got a good feeling about this one. I think we're going to have a good time. So, of course, I know a little bit of your background, but the listeners have no idea. Well, some of them hopefully do, but I'd say the most majority of them don't know who you are. So why don't you start off? Tell us a little about who you are and your martial arts background, and how you got started. Well, uh, as you said, my name is Mike Rowe, Michael Rowe, not the guy from Dirty Jobs, of course, as I always like to tell everyone, so they never get a, a misled impression. But uh, you know, I, I'm a simple uh, rural American out here in the Midwest, in Nebraska, I'm born, bred, and raised out here in the Omaha, Nebraska region. Uh, my martial arts background is, is, is <laughs> well, it's, it, it's kind of, it's a, a vast, so to speak, but uh uh, currently, I, I uh, hold a rank of 7th degree black belt in combat half keto under uh, Grandmaster John Pellegrini, as well as a 6th degree black belt in uh, <clears throat> Taekwondo under uh, various organizations that I've gone through as, uh, as I've aged. Uh, started in martial arts in the 1980s and I've, I've done a variety of things throughout. Uh, I, can, I can go in depth if, if you would like me to um, into how I got started. I, I love telling my uh, how you say martial arts origin stories? It's almost yeah, please. It's almost those are always fun. It's almost as good as being the you know, Spider Man, but you know, not quite. Uh, <laughs> you know, my everyone that I know in my in my age category that's ever started martial arts, yeah, you know, they got uh, intrigued uh, by TV or television. You know, uh, I think it was a kung fu TV series. Uh, I kind of caught it uh, in syndication. It was no longer first run when I first got it, uh, but uh, that that whole uh wandering around the west kicking and using your hands and feet versus guns that that always intrigued me and uh, uh i remember it kind of became part of my playtime all the time with my brother we were always doing something unarmed combat wise and then there was no real martial arts school in uh in the farm town that i lived in uh, the valley nebraska there was nothing there until about my sixth grade year 
And uh, we had one of these career day things where all these people and businesses around the area came in and talked to us kids about what we could possibly be in our lives. You know, we usually had the policemen, the firemen, construction workers, uh, uh, programmers and everything. And then there was a karate instructor that came in and he had just opened a small club in our town. Um, and he gave a brief class. Uh, I, I think I learned how to do a front snap kick and a high block, a punch and how to yell. That was it. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it was like a drug. I, I was hooked right there and then. <laughs> um, after that, of course, being a small town dojo that he had, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of people that were interested. It was like maybe a handful. So he had actually ended up closing after about six months. He went, you know, he went and moved uh, somewhere else. I think to Omaha, Nebraska, which was a still a bit of a drive for a sixth grader. Yeah, I don't have a car. But uh, so from there, I kind of just, uh, you know, I, I, I absorbed martial arts movies. And I just loved it. I never really gave up my dream. But then uh, I encountered high school sports and uh, wrestling. And it was a lot like martial arts as far as my mind was playing with. I mean, you learn to throw people around and wrestle around. It was, it was very much uh, martial arts. So I kind of went into that realm for a while. And I wrestled in high school. I went to the state national championships. I went and developed a dream and uh, decided I was going to go to Iowa State University. And that's where I was going to wrestle. And no one was going to talk me out of it. Not my mom, not my dad, not my high school wrestling coach. Uh, I was good, but I wasn't that good. I can say that now. But back then I did it. But uh, I was good enough. I went to Iowa State and I... I uh, tried out. I was was accepted as a walk on to the team, uh, but I was behind two awesome wrestlers, uh, Kevin Jackson and Michael Van Arsdale. And uh, Kevin Jackson is actually the uh, head coach for the Iowa State University wrestling team right now. So uh, he he won to, he won an Olympic gold in freestyle wrestling. He was an NCAA champion, All American. So if anyone ever would look back and go, oh yeah, well. Makes sense why you didn't really get anywhere on the team. You were right behind somebody that was <laughs> awesome. And we were in the same, uh, we were both freshmen at Iowa State at the time. So I wasn't going anywhere. Uh, but one day I had been working with Coach and uh, he, he gave me an assignment. He said, Do uh, 1,000 single leg takedowns on the dummy that was on the wall. And I had just finished, you know, 1,000 on each side, you know, 1,000 left, 1,000 right. I was a puddle of uh, goo laying on the mat uh, right by the door. Uh, there was nobody else except the coaches left in the practice room at that time. My eyes are closed and I hear a, a, a Korean accent. Now, please excuse me. I open my eyes, I look up and see this little oriental man and uh, wearing, you know, martial arts uniform with a black belt on. I went, oh, we have martial arts here? And he, uh, I moved just enough so he could get in and I talked to the assistant coach, uh, Ed Bannock, at the time. He said, I asked him who that was. And he said, that's uh, Master Pak. He teaches uh, the Taekwondo and Hapkido and the Judo programs here at Iowa State. I said, really? Cool. Uh, can you introduce me? Well, he's talking to Coach uh, Anderson right now. They're, he's the uh, uh, Judo advisor. So why don't you go ahead and ask Coach Anderson to introduce you? And I did. And... Uh, Master Pox uh, looked at me, you know, saw, you know, 167 pound. Uh, I, I had to be a pale as a ghost by that time. I'd already done three hours worth of wrestling practice and looked like something the cat drug in. And he said, you should try uh, judo. It'll help your wrestling. And I said, I said You're great, but I'm dead tired. I'm going to, uh, when is it? He said, uh, in about five minutes. Oh, uh, do I need a uniform? He said, just excuse me one second. He, he ducked into this little room off the, off the wrestling area, came back, and he, he uh, handed me a uniform. He said, here you go. Ready to go. I was like, oh. So the, my mind is going like, okay, I was hoping to at least get you know, a day's rest and try to figure this out. But no, no. He went through an hour and a half of judo. And uh, that my I, uh, I was hooked on judo now. I was like, uh, I had three blocks of, uh, of karate. I was hooked on karate. An hour and a half of judo, I was hooked. Uh, I'm I'm totally dead. I'm, I'm about ready to sponge myself off and, and crawl down the stairs to go down to the locker room. And uh, 
I hear uh, his voice calling from the back of the room again. You're not going to stick around for Hapkido? Uh, I looked at him. I was like, <laughs> I'm like, I just did three hours of wrestling, an hour and a half of your judo. And uh, quite frankly, I don't know if I have. Yes, sir, I'm coming in Hapkido. Why not? Yes. I, I answered myself. I took the Hapkido class. And uh, while it wasn't quite as intense uh, physically, uh, it was, I mean, we weren't going at the same pace like we were in judo. It was a little, I got a little bits of breathing room. <laughs> but uh, I got done with the Hapkido class, and I'm like, all right. And I did, I said, no, no more classes today, right? You're not going to talk to me. I'm just sticking around and do another hour or something. No, that's good. You come back tomorrow to do Taekwondo? I went, oh, of course I'm going to come back. Who am I kidding myself? I, I don't even know why I was thinking about it because. You know, since I was sixth grade, I've been dying to do martial arts. Now I have a, a gentleman just throwing it at me. It's like I couldn't believe it. So I, you know, all in one group. I, you know, by the next day, uh, I came in. He handed me a completely different uniform because while well, the judo and hapkido uniform were the same, and all those heavyweight uh, judo geese, the uh, the taekwondo one was a little bit uh, more lightweight and uh, a little different. So I, I did taekwondo, and next thing I know, I mean. I, I was there every day of the week after wrestling practice and and uh, sweating and and I think that was the best shave of my life. I you know if a person could really become Batman, I probably physically wise had had it at that time. I just didn't have the billions of dollars <laughs> to have a of a, sure. have a Batmobile and and and, and the Cavalier uniform. But hey, physically I was at the top of my peak there. And uh, but I did eventually have to come and make a decision that my wrestling wasn't going anywhere, so I, I dropped out of the wrestling team and focused entirely on, on, on Taekwondo, Hapkido, and Judo at Iowa State. Uh, and, wow. and I am so very, very glad I did. I mean, I, that's how I really got started in the martial arts. And Master Pac gave me a, uh, a love for the arts that uh, has today not abated. It's, it's still an inferno in, inside my belly eager to share with anyone I ever come across. Oh, that's great. Now, how long were you overlapping? How long was, was wrestling part of your life as well as the other martial arts? About a year. About a year is all okay. I, uh, I started. I remember wrestling practice started August uh, 24th of 1986 for me at Iowa State. September 8th uh, of uh, that same year is when I took the first uh, martial arts class with Master Pac. And... Uh, I think it was May when after Iowa State actually beat University of Iowa for the national championship, uh, we took away their tenth one in a row from them again from Gable. Uh, while I I loved it and was okay, I was part of this great team. I I, I really re recognize I was contributing very little to the team. I mean, I, I still love the sport and I still participate in wrestling. Uh, I just don't compete. I you know I, I help uh, little kids programs here in town. Um, wherever I've been a little bit still, but uh, I've, I've never been as in-depth as I was at, at Iowa State. Sure. So I'm curious, during that time where you're practicing essentially four different combat arts, what were the benefits of training those different disciplines simultaneously, and what were some of the challenges? Oh, well, let me start with the challenges. I can give you some wonderful challenges right now. There's a major fundamental difference between judo and wrestling that didn't enter my head. And I'm actually amazed it took me almost a year before I decided to give up one. Um, in wrestling, you need to keep your head up almost all the time when you're on the mat, when you're actually grappling and rolling around on the ground. You want to try to keep your head up to prevent you from getting turned over on your back and pinned. Um, however, you keep your head up in judo, you're going to get choked out so fast. Uh, it's not even funny. Uh, my first class, I came in, you know, I'm in there in judo. I'm going, I got partnered up um, with this little, you know, I didn't move very fast. So I was, I'm six foot two. 167 pounds at the time, and there's this little little female. She's about, I'd say she was five foot, if anything. Uh, you know, she was about 130 pounds. You know, she she wasn't no lightweight, but I still have height, you know, length. I've been wrestling since I was in the sixth grade. Um, I thought, wow, you know, I'll take it easy on her. You know, brain 
did not kick in. My head is up or on the ground. I'm, you know, I'm not thinking about being choked yet. I, this is my first workout. And next thing I know, I'm unconscious and I'm, I'm feeling slaps on my face. And I'm hearing you, okay? You okay, Michael? Uh, <laughs> I look up and there's Master Pac just smiling at me. Uh, my first introduction that Koreans think you know, being choked out is hilarious. Because uh, Master Pac did it to me so often. He, every time he woke me up, he had a smile on his face. I, it had to be part of their sense of humor, I think, from the Korean Judo College. But uh, I, that, that major fundamental was, you know, okay, so I would wrestle from 3 to about 5.30. Judo was at six. Okay, I, I I would get into one habit, keep head up, keep head up, get choked out about halfway through judo. I got into the habit of keeping my head down, keep my head down. Next day wrestling practice, my head's down, I'm getting pinned again. Oh, get my head back up, get my head back up. Uh, two wrestling practices would go before I had to worry about that, and then I'd go back in judo and oh, getting choked out again, get your head down. Uh, that was a constant cycle. So while there are so many similarities between judo and wrestling. There was one fundamental area. It was just it was it was in, almost impossible for a beginner in judo, mind you, to get that that connect to go. Okay, here this is where I'm at. I need to do this. Uh, oh, this is where I'm at. I need to do this. And it took me a while before I finally got that dichotomy taken care of. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, I found that the wrestling uh, helped me out tremendously in terms of judo. Uh, in Taekwondo competition, however, uh, I was very, very used to the concept. I mean, I've been competing in wrestling. Like I said, I, I'd started back in the junior high and you know, sixth grade year and had been wrestling. So while there was no martial arts, it, there was a lot of similarities about strategy that would work very well in terms of being aggressive, giving way, uh, push when pulled and pull when push, that kind of thing that was very fundamental in uh, martial arts training that I had already developed a good understanding of uh, ring management, competition-wise, good sportsmanship, those aspects of the martial arts are, you know, whether uh, wrestling or judo, hapkido, taekwondo, they were all the same. It, they they all interacted very nicely. The One of the things I found that uh, I liked about the various arts was they all kind of complemented each other in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I developed, you know, a, a, a very good understanding in pretty much what, what I call the five combat ranges, you know, unreachable distance, you know, kicking, punching, close combat, and grappling. Uh, I, I got comfortable in all five of those ranges through the training in basically these four combat of, uh, sports and arts. So uh, I found as a plus, it was just the fact that because I'm doing fundamentally or while well, similarly, you know, other than judo, while well, Japanese, everything else, uh, Korean Taekwondo and Hapkido, they had the same philosophies. And uh, wrestling, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, you know, Gre Greco Roman and freestyle history concepts going there with uh, some European thought. So I, I felt I was getting like the best of all worlds. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of diversity there. And that was one of the things that when you and I started talking, uh, not just today, but, you know, as we started emailing and setting up this episode, it was the thing that really struck me was that you had such diversity. And of course, most of our guests have trained in more than one thing, but your roots are deep in multiple things. And most people don't have that. And so I can really see that synergy there in your origin story. And of course, I've got a little bit of foreshadowing with what we're going to talk about as we move forward, but I think that the listeners are going to see that varied perspective come through, and I'm excited to hear some of your answers to these questions. Well, let's move on to the... I'm sorry. No, nothing. Go ahead. I was going to say... Oh, don't want to cut you off. This is this is your episode, <laughs> not mine. So uh, let's go on. Let's start story time. Not that your origin story isn't a great story. I mean, it's actually pretty interesting for me and, and I'm sure for everyone else, but we're all about the stories here. So I'd like you to tell us your best martial arts story. Now uh, that's, you know, I've listened to a lot of your, uh, your episodes and I started you know, trying to think about this. I knew this was going to be one of the questions you asked and uh, the best, it's, it's, it's so tough to, to narrow them down. I really are. 
I have some good ones, and some of them, um, I, I feel that all my best stories are ones that where I can at least poke some fun at myself. Um, but I think one of my best stories, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, used to have, I don't know, I kind of got a little bit out. When I got out of competitive Taekwondo, I lost track. He may still have some kind of a physical fitness and martial arts super show that he had in uh, Chicago. And uh, I went to it back in, uh, like it was 91, I believe. Uh, was there, I brought a few of my students. We went, we watched the competitions. We went going to all these seminars, uh, having a great time with everyone there. And uh, I remember that we were in a hotel room. That was where the convention center was. And I think it was on, uh, I was in the lobby. I was talking to some of the, uh, some of the people that I had just met there. And, I was talking a little bit about pressure points and, and, and vital areas on the body and heal those soul techniques that I learned in, in, in Hapkido and uh, sharing some knowledge there. And I, we're talk, I'm talking to this fairly big muscular guy and I'm, I'm telling us like, you know, the solar plexus area that, you know, depending on how fit you do your abs and strength wise, there's about an area somewhere from a silver dollar to a quarter size that no matter how hard you work, you never get your muscles picked up over it. There's a spot there that, you know, even with two fingers, you just drive into it, put even Arnold Schwarzenegger down to his knees. And I hear from behind me in the, I can't do an Australian accent, but I basically hear, really? I turn around and there's Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's like, oh, crap. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Oh, sir, how are you? And I, I said, so, so just pushing you to put my on my knees, you know, uh, in that thick Australian accent, Australian Austrian accent that he has. Uh, and I said, yes, sir, I'm fairly confident that even yes, you with just two fingers, I can make you a little buckle or take a step back. He said, well, let's try. So, well, he's wearing his suit, so I had to approximate with just an off site where, where, where his tie was. And I put my fingers right there, drove straight through. And he's got some strong abs, I can tell you that. And he had, at that time, it was still in very good shape. But I, I found the right spot right off the bat. And yeah, he took a step back and it, he didn't quite go to the ground, but you could hear her go, Hoof! and knocked the wind out of him. And it, it was a good time. It was, uh, I, I really wish I had the cell phone capabilities I had today because, I would have had that thing on video. <laughs> it was a, wow. Uh, it, was, it was a great thing. And, you know, everyone's going like, wow, really, it works. Like, yes, you, don't, you just got to hit the right spots. Uh, but that, that was one of the, the better uh, martial arts, you know, one of my better stories that I tell people is like, you know, you meet people, but it's always important when you're going to drop a name, look behind you first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially at his event, yeah, right? At his event, like, oh, you know, everyone had seen Arnold, he was still in, you know, he wasn't in his Mr. Olympia condition anymore, but you know he was still, you know he was still doing a lot of those action movies at the time, and he was still looking very fit. He he was still in very good shape. Uh, sure. Was there any kind of dialogue with him afterwards? Did he want to know what you had done? Or? Well, we we talked for a little bit. You know, I think we he had a, a heavy schedule already, but we spent about 10, 15 minutes talking about uh, at that time my martial arts background. Uh, and uh, what I was doing and uh, how, how I was going through. He, we talked about Master Pac a little bit. Uh, uh, he had met somebody that actually knew Master Pac very well. I was like, the, mar the martial arts and fitness world, I found out, was a very small place. Uh, the seven degrees of separation seems to me like a little bit more like five degrees. But uh, there's, it was just amazing. Uh, we, we, we had spent some time. He encouraged me tremendously. Uh, and... and uh, I went and took another step towards um, wanting to teach full time uh, after that meeting, and actually, uh, it, it, shortly thereafter, it did uh, become a, a possibility. Oh, cool! Because, of course, if you can demonstrate that what you're doing is effective, even on someone like him, then I mean, it's going to work on anybody. That, that was the idea. <laughs> <think that's what laughs> it's a lot, lot of confidence of, there. What a lot of people thought about is like, wow, that worked on Arnold. Wow. Of course, now, granted. He was standing still. He actually, it was more like a challenge. I don't think, uh, uh, I, was just, I was still maybe 170 pounds at that time. I was still a strapping little skinny guy. Uh, and, you know, mostly muscle myself, but uh, compared to Arnold, I, I was kind of small. <laughs> 
probably a little bit of an understatement there. Uh, of course, he was ready for it and probably not going to let you get away with it too easily. He, he was all, all, you could feel that his abs were all tense and everything. He's like, go ahead, go, you do it. I go, <laughs> okay, sir. <laughs> and, um, and he, oh, he was about, I'd say, six inches from actually putting his knee on the ground. But he stopped himself. And oh. it, was, it was, I felt proud of myself at the time because I would say, you know, what was it? Uh, I can't remember which one of his movies. With you know, uh, Girl Lemon, you know, <laughs> I, I compared to him, I look like I, I a really small guy. <laughs> yeah, you're like like uh, Danny DeVito in Twins. Yeah, I wasn't you know <laughs> weight wise, <laughs> yes, height wise, I was his equal. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So let's let's roll back. Let's jump into some parallel timeline where that day that career day where that gentleman comes in that doesn't happen you don't get to experience martial arts in that way you don't get to really feel your passion for it and you know let's say you don't go to Iowa State or Master Pac isn't there and you live your life without martial arts how do you think it would be different now well uh I'd be a mess. I really would. Uh, I, I think I would be a total mess. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I probably would actually be. Uh, I was totally unfocused as a as a youth. Uh, I had no focus. No, uh, I was. I was the first kid in in our school district. You know, actually, in the in pretty much in the county that was diagnosed with uh, was then um, kinetic brain disorder, which is now known as tension deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, people didn't really know how to deal with me very well. Uh, learning different different learning styles, uh, the teachers weren't very big on it. If it had been for martial arts, bringing me more into focus and learning to put that energy to better uses uh, through, through mental control and physical control that the martial arts gave me, I don't know where I would be elsewise. Um, I mean, I would. I think I would have started trying to get to college. Still, uh, you know, wrestling was good, but I didn't. It wasn't quite the same level of focus that was taught to me when I got into martial arts training. Uh, so I probably was still gone to Iowa State, but if Master, if I'd never met Master Pac and never really got into it, uh, I probably would still be a programmer analyst. Was one for about ten years. Uh, I majored in, in computer science at one point, and uh, I'd probably still be unhappy somewhere in the back of my head, and not know really why I didn't like it. <laughs> but uh, I, I'd probably still be, yeah, a programmer in, in computer science world, IT guy. You know, I was fairly good at it, but it wasn't where I found my my greatest gifts, and. and but I probably would never have found those gifts without martial arts. I never would have once. And of course, you know, we could kind of hear you, I don't want to say struggle, but, you know, really consider piecing that answer together. And, and I genuinely believe that the people that end up in the martial arts for their lifetime are really destined to be there. I mean, I, I can't imagine my life without the martial arts. I mean, you're answer is very similar to what most other people have said as guests on the show, that there's something that martial arts brought them that they needed, whether it be confidence or in your case, focus. And thankfully you found it. Oh, my parents say so too. I mean, I went from being, uh, I'd say I went from barely being able to graduate high school. <laughs> I, uh, I graduated. That's about all I can say. I mean, I, I, I'm by no means not an intelligent person. I did well in the ACTs. Every test they ever give to me is great. But my focus before I got to college in the martial arts was horrendous. My mom and dad would tell me, yeah, we were just glad he graduated. We were, weren't sure. But, you know, since then, you know, I went and got, I have two bachelor's degrees. I have uh a master's degree now, uh, education-wise, I'm, I'm much more focused on on uh, aspects that allow me to study and, and learn things more, and more importantly, uh, let me teach more. Uh, I like to, sh uh, 
I heard it once. Uh, I think it was a TV show was a, for medical doctors. You know, you you see one, you do one, then you teach one. That's the best way to learn something. And I found in the martial arts techniques or and, and everything that is simply the truth of all 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 aspects of of, of learning is. Any skill, any any bit of knowledge, you know, you, you learn it, yeah, you see it being done, and then you teach it being done. It's, 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 and had I not had the martial arts that teach me that, I don't know where I'd be. I know I wouldn't be as happy as I am today. Yeah. And, of course, that's the important piece, right, is, is being happy with life and, and feeling satisfied and fulfilled. Exactly. So... Let's roll back. You know, of course, we're back to reality here, and you, you do have all of your martial arts experience. And I'd like you to think about a time that maybe didn't go so well. You know, it could be a day or could be a year, whatever it is. Think about some challenge that you had to overcome and how your martial arts training helped you do that. Well, this, that one's really easy, actually. Um, I'm a naval reservist. I've, uh, I've, I've deployed to uh, the Middle East three times. In my second tour of duty, uh, I went to Iraq. I did uh, detaining operations. And the best I can say is that I came back um, not as happy, not as you know, uh, early signs of PTSD and anxiety disorder. Um, I wasn't teaching regularly anymore. Uh, after my second deployment, the, the individual I was uh, – I was helping run a school for a friend of mine, and uh, I was teaching. And then after the second deployment, it, it just it wasn't working out for him so well. And you know, because he was a small business, he didn't have to keep my position open when I was gone. So he just really, you know, found another person to help him out around the school. So I wasn't teaching anymore. And uh, I kind of, I will admit, I kind of slowly fell into a, a bit of a small and downward spiral but it wasn't until I uh, started teaching again it was the the sharing of knowledge and, and seeing the, the things that were important and bringing that focus and and drive back from where I would I had before it was was no longer there for a while it, it brought me back uh, to, to always be able to find that 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 good angle so to speak it's like when you're uh, you're fighting. There's always an angle that you can take on somebody to overcome them. There, there's no one that's unbeatable, and I think that was the, that philosophy allowed me to attack most of my uh, anxiety and, and and traumatic stress that uh, has allowed me to function on a daily basis again. I I'm a much more uh, trouble person to be around, and now. Granted, that took about a year's worth of uh, steady getting back into teaching. I had, like I said, quit teaching for a while and uh, I'm slowly getting back into the, the saddle. So you've had the opportunity to train with some pretty great people. And, you know, of course, I know some of the names that I'm pretty sure are going to come up as we move forward. Um, but I'd like you to think of someone other than your direct martial arts instructors that was really influential, uh, important in your martial arts upbringing. And tell us who they would be. Wow, that's a, that, that one's a tough one. Uh, you know, other than my <laughs> you know, martial arts instructors, and I've had I had some really close uh, connections with all of them. But if I had to pick somebody that's not a direct martial art instructor of mine, a teacher that on a regular basis, I would have to say um, the one that was most influential. Actually, it was uh, Master Chief uh, Dobbins. He was a uh, he was one of, he was my uh, senior enlisted advisor on, on on one of my deployments, and he's actually the one that kind of got to get me back into started thinking about teaching while I was in Iraq. Uh, he, he said, "You know, you have so much information and you're helping people with it. Why are you not sharing it on a daily basis?" Uh, and he, he had such a a way of looking at my, uh, what I could, best could say, he kind of tore, tore away my last bastion of insecurity. Uh, like, what makes me special in my mind? You know, I would say before I talking to him, he says, you know, you're just as good as uh, Seagal or Chuck Norris or anyone else. All they have is that they have been in the movies. 
you have just as much information. I love the teaching. Uh, everyone here, and he helped arrange a lot of things for me in terms of working with uh, the military and our allies and in, in, in Iraq and Kuwait and you know, even some people from uh, Great Britain and, and uh, Israel had come and worked with me a little bit while I was in, in the Middle East. And uh, he, I think, really took away that last bastion of me thinking, you know, I'm just a little guy from uh, Nebraska and I'm not that important. But he made me see that I do have information. I have, I've gathered it from all over the world with various instructors from uh, my, my Hapkido instructor, Grandmaster John Pellegrini, uh, my Arnese instructors, Bram Frank, you know, um, Taekwondo with Master Pak, Grand, the late uh, Grandmaster Edward B. Sell. I have all kinds of knowledge and from various sources. And sometimes it just seems that it's too many to name. I mean, I've, I've studied from you know, the traditional arts, Taekwondo, Okinawan Karate, uh, the Filipino arts of Arnis. He is, he just said, he, he brought it all together. He said, you have something to give. And I think that's been the best influence I've ever had. So prior to him, prior to those discussions, that encouragement, was instructing something that you, I've got a feeling it's something you had done and you enjoyed doing, but it really sounds like there was a light switch moment there. That that was a light switch moment. I did start teaching. Uh, I had always, I, I ran my first club part-time at Iowa State University back in 1988. Um, and then, uh, you know, I went to seminars all over the world that I could go to. Anytime I had money and, and got anywhere, I, I'd go to places. I started teaching. I had my first club in 1990 in uh, Elkhorn, Nebraska. It was small and fairly successful. It was, it was just uh, Taekwondo because I could not afford, I was a poor college student, uh, paying tax to the home, so to speak. I couldn't afford decent maps. Uh, Hapkido was out, Judo was out, so what's that leave me? Taekwondo. And it was pretty successful, and I was having a good time, and I really enjoyed it. I was, I was a budding computer programmer at the time. And then in Taekwondo Times, I read a little uh, ad in the back of the magazine. John Pellegrini is looking for a full-time instructor for his one of his schools in Florida. And I'm, I'm looking at that one. The name is kicking my butt, uh, ringing a bell. And uh, I remember in 1988, I went to the uh, National Collegiate Taekwondo Championships, uh, senior, the senior uh, nationals down in Miami, Florida. Uh, and... After after I had some time, there was a there was a, a seminar and, and and this gentleman, uh, Master John Pellegrini, was was teaching a slight variation of of hapkido. Um, you know, it wasn't quite the traditional hapkido that I was learning, but it was it was very similar. Uh, he was calling it uh, combat hapkido, um, and I saw what he's he's hiring. I was like, well, this is as good time as any. I'm barely making a living as a programmer at this time. Uh, Y2K is just becoming a kind of a thing. No one's talking too much about it. They're saying there might be some problems coming in the future. And uh, I went down to uh, Grandmaster Pellegrini school and interviewed. And uh, next thing I know, I'm, I'm packing up all my belongings into a Nissan Sentra and a U-Haul trailer behind me. And I moved to Florida from Nebraska. And I found I loved it. And now I'm getting an opportunity to teach Taekwondo and Hapkido. I loved it. I tremendously loved it. And, but eventually I did move back to Nebraska. I'm a Cornhusker at heart, I guess. Uh, while I liked Florida, it was enjoyable. But I also got a job offer because uh, Y2K was now becoming more of a thing around 1995. And so I got a pretty good offer. I come up here and the offer then falls through. And now I don't have any money to move back to Florida and start teaching again. So I opened a club. Started having a good time. Uh, I, I ran. A, I developed a club in my town, and by the time I, I got up to a nice level, I'd gotten married, and then I got divorced, and I kind of had to close the school, and uh, I got gun shy. And at that point, uh, I will admit that's that's I had a, a downfall, and it wasn't until I talked to you know, Master Chief Dobbins opened my eyes again and got my, you know. 
uh, editing for a family listening, I guess, a simply the fact that uh, he kicked my butt back into gear. Good, and it sounds like it's good that he did. I believe there are people that are destined to teach. You know, of course, I, I feel that everyone has something that they can share that, you know, even the, the newest white belt, you know, when you work with them, there's something everybody can learn. But I think that there are some people whose true path through the martial arts really is around teaching. And it sounds like you're one of those people. And so I'm glad that he kicked you in the butt, so to speak. And so am got I. You so out am teaching I. I'm very again. glad for that. Good. Good. And, you know, it, it's funny when I hear about schools closing down, it's not the majority of the time, but there's a, a fairly substantial commonality of divorce <laughs> coming through that, you know, and, and uh, you know, we certainly don't need to unpack that. But I uh, just wanted to point that out that, you know, if there's anybody out there listening who's found a divorce or the end of a significant relationship having a tremendous impact on their role in the martial arts, you are not alone. Uh, definitely not alone. There's a lot of us out there. Yeah. So our next question is around competition. And you mentioned having attended uh, a Taekwondo championship and, and meeting Grandmaster Pellegrini there. Did I get that right? Well, I met him while, after the tournament. But uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So obviously you've you've been to at least one competition. Have you had the opportunity to participate in competition? Oh, yes. I participate very much when I was at Iowa State. Uh, I was a member of the 1988 and 1989 National Collegiate Taekwondo Championship teams for Iowa State University. Uh, I, I actually uh, went to uh, the Senior Nationals in 1988. When I went to the Senior Nationals in 1988, uh, that was the first year for the, Olympic tr uh, for the Olympics. It was going to be a demonstration sport in uh, in Seoul, Korea there, and I was extremely excited for it. Uh, they brought brought me in. They had things going on. Uh, Mr. Park said, you should go. Uh, I went and fought in the Walter Lake Division. I did a pretty good job there, and I, I did fairly well overall. Uh, on, I did competitions, you know, in, uh, all throughout the Midwest area, and I will say I was, I hate writing in my own home, but after I became black belt, I was regularly first or second place everywhere I went it, it was pretty much that that was going to happen and then I competed on a higher level and I was very happy to find that the challenges were there I never really made the team uh, I found that in 88 uh, I got I got beat uh, basically by an injury again from the army's representative at the, at the tournament I killed the tore in my Achilles tendon and uh, kind of took me out of that tournament I didn't have much to go for after that I, despite my ego a little bit there uh, you know, I, I finished that match basically because well I was a Navy guy and he's an army guy and I, I can't let him just win it <laughs> but uh, I, I fought well and then 92 I went to my last senior uh, nationals uh, for the for the Barcelona games hoping to go that division I was a heavyweight uh, found out that you know even at heavyweights they still move around like they were flyweights it seems like to me they were moving very very fast and Eventually, I got to the point where I realized uh, I was more like the uh, original Enterprise, and I'm fighting people that were in Enterprise E, much faster, much more agile than me. So I, I went to coaching and, and, and just refereeing for a while. But after I, I got affiliated with Combat Hapkido and went more into the uh, Combat Heavy Hapkido realm and self defense, I kind of moved more and more away from competition. Cool. Well, good. Now, if you had the chance to train with somebody that you hadn't, who do you think that would be? Uh, someone I haven't, alive or dead? or is it... Either one. We'll, we'll open it nice and wide for you. <laughs> um, it'd be kind of a tie in my mind uh, between uh, Osensei Oshiba, the founder of Aikido, or uh, Itvan, um, uh, Win Chung practitioner, the gentleman who taught yeah. uh, Bruce Lee. Um, I I had a chance to train with uh, basically uh, Osensei's. Oh, let's see, his son, grand grandson, no, great grandson. Uh, I was in Japan recently. Got to work at the uh, the humble do dojo and got thrown around by uh, Doshu Ushiba, and uh, and I and that was. Fantastic! I'm just trying to imagine what I, what I could have learned from from the founder, and that 
the, the, the power that he was repetitive to have, and uh, I would love to have experienced that. And then again, it's uh, very similar to Itman. I, I heard have heard amazing stories and from uh, from people who uh, had worked with uh, Bruce Lee, and uh, and uh, who talked about you know, his instructor, uh, Grandmaster Itman, just as much as I, I think those would be one of the two people I would really love to have to spend some time with. Mm. And certainly, O Sensei has come up on the show, and I don't know if Itman has been mentioned in, as an answer to this question, but certainly has come up in conversation because yeah, two absolute legends in the martial arts. And one of the things that struck me, as you mentioned, both of them is their reputation, not only for their skill, but for their, uh, the, the quality of their character. And I kind of had a little bit of a mental tangent. You know, you know, I talked about <laughs> tangents and, and, and your proclivity for them. What I didn't tell you is, is mine as well. Uh, which is, why it's good for me that the guest carries most of the weight of the show. I just have to poke you once in a while with a new question. But I'm wondering, you know, as I think of Masayama and, and so many of these other people that founded styles that carry on today, I don't know of any of them where people have said bad things about their character. And I'm just I'm having this thought. I'm wondering if, if is that... Um, just the way history has been written, or is there something there? Well, I'm, so I don't know. I'm sure that it's pretty much uh, how history has been written, because you know we're all wonderful human beings, but we're all fundamentally flawed somewhere. Uh, you know, whether it might be maybe you know, that we smoke or curse too much, or or but everything that gets remembered almost always seems to be the the good things. Whenever we've had a good influence on people's lives. Uh, you know, I've I've known instructors that you know they they've always preached very highly, you know, uh, and and that smoking was bad for your health. It was never good. But then sooner or later, someone that instructor might be get caught that they're smoking. Well, that seems hypocritical. But it's not so much that they know what the problem is. They know it's not good for them, and they're trying to get the idea to their students. This is bad for you. It is. If I was not with this bad habit, it, what what else could I do? What more could I be doing if I had better lung capacity or if I had a, a stronger heart? You know, we all have our little things that are our downfalls, and I know every single you know, um, one of us. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure O Sensei had his little. I know he was very well known for his anger, uh, but it would explode at a moment's notice, but then it would subside rather quickly. Uh, so everyone has their little things, but you know, character-wise, everyone remembers them for the really good things that they know. Mm. Sort of a, an adaptation of histories written by the victor. Yes, exactly. When it, when it comes to, to combat history. So you mentioned Itman, of course, and most people's experience with Itman would be from the movies that have come out. I mean, and not just the major ones that were released that most of us know there were all these films profiling him that have come out in Hong Kong over the last decade or so. So I'm wondering if some of your experience with him comes from those movies. Are you at all a martial arts movie fan? I'm a, I'm a martial arts movie aficionado. All the good ones, all the bad An ones. An aficionado. I, I, okay. So you're, you're taking it up a I'm notch. I'm taking it up a notch. I mean, I, 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 everything from the bad, you know, five fingers of death stuff that, you know, the, uh, the Chinese Kung Fu theater that I, you know, I didn't get to experience it on television very well until uh, I was a teenager because we didn't have cable in Nebraska until uh, I was about 15. That's when I think when cable first came out. And I got some of the West Coast channels. And every Sunday then it was, you know, there was Kung Fu Theater. And it was it was terrible acting, terrible lip syncing, and nothing, nothing was right. But I just loved the action, you know, the flying, the wire work. You know, even though you could still see some of the wires in, in special effects then compared to today, um, the stuff that you know, has come out today, you know, everything from Jason Statham, uh, Snow Gall's stuff, Chuck Norris's movies, and, you know, Bruce Lee, you know, Bob Dye. I, I, I pretty much, anytime I, there's a movie that's got martial arts, I'll, I'll, I'll watch it, you know. And Do you have a favorite? A favorite? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
<sighs> or a couple favorites if pinning it down to one is too hard. Well, I, I have uh, memories are strongly tied to the Karate Kid. I actually, I, uh, my mom and dad are probably going to find out about this one if they haven't figured it out not by now. They might as well. I had uh, borrowed the family car while my mom and dad and brother went to the rodeo. I on opening night of Karate Kid in, in, in Nebraska, I drove to Fremont, even though. Uh, I wasn't supposed to take the car and went saw the Karate Kid, and I, that was, I think, the first time I'd seen martial arts. I would say that it's it's not about uh, vengeance or, or, or competition. The, the Miyagi character I thought was was a very uh, touching and uh, put teaching into a new light, something that I hadn't seen in and I. I, I've desired to emulate some kind in some way with, with everything that I do as well. So I mean, I, I put Karate Kid right up there, the original one, with uh, uh, Pat Morita and uh, Daniel Russo. So the, the, I forgot his name. Uh, right. Mach- Ralph Pat Machio. Machio yeah. My, yeah. my wife, I had a crush on him, so I, I don't know why I forget his name. <laughs> I, think, I think most younger women did <laughs> back then. And of course, you look at him now, and he's in his early 50s, and he barely looks any different he's aged of, depending on your perspective either very well or very unfortunately yeah i, I think i saw him on a, a couple episodes of how i met your mother and he's like, that, like wow and he's look still got the boys the face there you know poor guy <laughs> uh, but, and he's st- he's still on the the short list for guests that we really want to get on the show too so if anybody out there listening has a tie with ralph macchio please uh, help us out but the, other ones, you know, I mean, I like, you know, martial arts movies. I, 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 I'm a big Jackie Chan fan. Uh, actually, uh, uh, my my first date with my uh, my current wife, uh, we went and saw a Jackie Chan movie. Uh, she, I don't think she knew who the heck he was. I think she just was willing. I was supposed to have a date with someone else that night, and she canceled on me. And I called up uh, my it wasn't my wife then, mind you. So, uh, I had Dan Camps, you want to go see Jackie Chan film with me? She said yes, and uh, I think she was just glad to be asked. And then uh, I saw it kind of anytime Jackie Chan puts out a movie, it's tied right to my to my mind with good times with uh, with my current wife. So we we go see all his movies. Oh, that's fun. Do you remember which one it was? Operation Condor. Mm. And of course, we're gonna. Link all these and everything in the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for anyone that might be new to the show. Cool. So you mentioned a few actors, and I'm wondering if you have a favorite amongst them or, or maybe another name that you didn't mention. Oh, my favorite uh, actor-wise is I'm Jason Statham, uh, Transporter series. He's got a, a, a style of, of what he works with, looks a lot like what I would call you know, fast acting combat hack, you know, joint manipulation throws. He's very adaptable, takes whatever's around him. Very similar to what I teach with my students, you know. This is, so I, Jason Statham's kind of right now at the top of my list at the moment. Yeah, and of course, he's been mentioned quite a few times as an answer to that question. And it's interesting because he does have, a, you know, I've done the research. He's got a little bit of a martial arts background, but it, seems like it's been exclusively for the purpose of his acting. And he just gets it. He's tremendous. It, it's, it's just a wonder. I mean, how did they utilize him? You know, granted, I know the magic of Hollywood can make almost anyone look good. Uh, but everything that you know, he shows off and, and does in, in the movies is, seems to always be you know, taking advantage of the environment around you whenever possible. And that's that's exactly what I teach him with, uh, with the combat Hapkido system that I mostly work with. Uh, with Grandmaster John Pellegrini taught me is it's 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 about utilizing what's in the moment and what's around you to your best ability. So that's kind of why I like I like Jason. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Sure, sure. Now, how about books? Are you at all a martial arts text reader? Oh yes, in indubitably, so to speak. <laughs> uh, I have about 
20 foot lockers in my basement full of martial arts books. So, uh, I can't seem to, oh, wow. I can't seem to get rid of any of them. I, I don't, I can't part with them. Uh, I just, I have a reading library for my students. That, you know, basically they can't get a hold of a book. I say, okay, well, here's a copy of mine. Bring it back to me. Uh, I, I read, you know, things. I got a few that I'm working on slowly. Google translate is a wonderful tool. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm slowly translating some things I got in Korean and uh, Japanese, utilizing that. And it's not perfect, but I'm getting a lot of good information as I go through it. And it's it's taken it's taken a lot of time to learn to technology to utilize those keyboards to put things in. Sure. So now I'm curious because you're the first person who's indicated that they've done anything like that on this show. What is it about these texts that? Either you're you're intrigued with, or there are answers to questions you're hoping to find. You know what's motivating that work. Well, I look at it that way. Is that uh, you know some of my martial arts, their origins are other countries and, and other thoughts, um, coming from a, an Aristotle line of thinking, uh, you know, Socrates' methods, uh, using the Socratic method, you know, questioning, asking. And I have a certain way of looking at things as a, a Westerner in the United States. Um, I have a certain way of communicating things and I have found as a teacher that when I sometimes communicate some of my Western ideas to um, people with other thoughts, you know, whether they were a, 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 you know, Japanese, Korean, uh, Iraqi, Kuwaiti, some things don't quite come out right in my English. and. Now, granted, sometimes it's a need having to work hard and try to find the closest fitting word in Japanese, and they seem to get it better when it's when they get it into their language a little bit. But I think when uh, even better is when some of them have come back to me, like you know, maybe a year later when their English got better and they understand the nuances of of uh, a parable a little better. Uh, as I dig in there, you know, I, I will admit some of the translations. I go and I scratch my head. Uh, they're they're using parables because they're being written for an audience that is, you know, a native speaker, uh, someone who speaks Korean or reads Korean at least, or or yeah. Japanese. So they use parables, and and they don't translate them directly. May not make the most sense until I dig, 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 and and, and try to find something that makes more sense. What what's that parable about? And and, and and have to go find that parable and you know, you know people of Japanese in nature know the Ronin, the 47 Ronin story rather well. And it's one of the stories that is better known now amongst Westerners but still there's references to some of their some things that they have a parable to. You may as well be saying you know monkey scratches its head. You don't know what heck it means. <laughs> yeah, sure. Does your is there any kind of a theme to your book collection, or is it just martial arts? Oh, I have I, I, I have martial arts. I have you know uh, theology. I have science. I have uh, my book collection is just vast. I I, I don't I, I'm just an avid reader. Uh, the best thing I ever had, the greatest gift in my opinion. Some people haven't got. They go, oh, it's the death of books. Uh, I got a nook before my second deployment to Iraq, and. Uh, one of the things that kept me from going completely crazy over um, on my deployments was reading, but uh, they start taking up space. They, they, they fall apart. And my nook, yeah. I had, you know, taking anywhere, granted, you know, wherever I can get a battery charge, I was limited to, but I had pretty good uh, electrical outputs wherever I went. Having that, I had in, my, in the space of a little notepad, I had over 300, 400 books with me. Now, my collections, once the digital library gets into place, is ridiculous, but I mean, I'll read anything from, you know, uh, how to prevent hacking, how to, you know, I still do things in the computer realm, uh, science, anatomy, physiology. I just love to read. Sometimes it makes uh, me uh, have to take a step back and I'll try to figure out what it is I'm reading because I'm sometimes definitely reading over my head in some things, but <laughs> uh, I got a good a good library full of books from all things. 
So if I was to pin you down for a single book recommendation for our audience, what might that be? Uh, Living the Martial Way by Forrest, uh, Morgan Forrest. Forrest. I'm looking at it backwards now. Um, Forrest Morgan, uh, he's a retired lieutenant colonel. Um, he's uh, Living the Martial Way. It, it talks about you know, things like strategy and developing a concept of doctrine and, and how, you know, Defining honor for what you're really talking about, you know, having, well, you always heard that, you know, I have to defend my honor kind of thing. And, and, and he kind of goes into just talking about that, uh, that myth, so to speak, and, and, and how it should go. Uh, a better overall method of training, uh, incorporating uh, traditional training methods with modern training methods, concepts like uh, Shuguru and uh, Intense summer training, intense winter training, you know, environmental training. It, it's, it's a really good book to be good reading out there. Okay, cool. And I'll make sure we find that and link to it again in, in the show notes over at the website. Now, do you have any goals or anything that you're working towards for the future with regard to your training or, or the martial arts in general? Well, right now I'm in the middle. I'm developing and uh, starting opening a school again. I'm in Nebraska out here in Wahoo. Uh, rural martial arts program uh, built a whole nonprofit organization uh, to, to teach self-defense to you know the students in the area as well as uh, developed a fully self-defense program that it's, it's called herd uh, help everyone <coughs> excuse me help everyone appreciate and respect diversity as well as a, a program for teaching educators uh, self-defense uh, we really tie our teachers hands and what they can and cannot do uh, to protect themselves from, from unruly and sometimes aggressive students. And uh, I've been working on a program with, with, with some teachers. My uh, sister-in-law is a teacher. Uh, I have several friends that work in the education field, and they've uh, expressed that some of the stuff that I taught would work really, really well, but we have to work on uh, modifying things to, so liability and parents don't end up suing the schools and things like that. So those are some of the things I'm really working on developing right now. Uh, in terms of programming, I'm, I'm still working on uh, teaching a, uh, a curriculum of, of Hapkido to, to children all the way from starting age four all the way up to you know, 84. Uh, I got um, development in those areas. I'm working on trying to get some self-defense videos that will complement Grandmaster Pellegrini's stuff. Hopefully that uh, he'll approve of. It's some of the things I'm getting to work on in the future there. Got a lot of irons in the fire, so to speak. Yeah. You know, that seems to be true of many of our guests that people reach a certain level and realize, hey, it's time for me to make sure that this stuff that I've figured out is is out there for other people. And personally, you know, I appreciate that, not just of you, but of, but of everyone, because the more that knowledge that's out there that we're sharing with each other, the better we're all going to be as martial artists and the easier it's going to be for those that start martial arts in the future and it's what it's all about is just sharing our knowledge uh as uh i've i was taught by a couple of my teachers uh without without my students who would i be i mean uh you can't be much of a teacher if you don't have students i took a pause for a second to write that down because that right there that is an amazing quote and one that i don't think has come up before so thank you for sharing that that's cool glad to be helpful so, <laughs> you've been tremendously helpful. This is a great episode. So this is kind of your commercial time. You know, if there's something you want to promote, if you do seminars or whatever you've got going on, let us have it. Well, like I said, I'm starting to open up a school and I'm starting to get out there to do teaching seminars. I do self-defense seminars as well as uh, you know, Taekwondo sparring seminars as well as uh, some some uh, traditional and uh, uh what I would call improvisational weapons seminars. Uh, I'm just getting started, but everyone's more welcome to take a look at that at www.alphaomegamartialarts, all one word, alphaomegamartialarts.org uh, to check out our how our school's doing, what events are got, what got planned going on, as well as any upcoming seminars that we have coming and uh, that we are hopefully going to be doing here in the near future. Awesome. And we'll link to that. And, you know, as you have other things that pop up in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out and we'll make sure that we either update your show notes here or 
put stuff out to our listeners over social media. Oh, I appreciate that. No, oh, hey, I appreciate you being here. And as we start to wrap up, do you have any parting advice for everyone listening? The, the biggest bit of advice I can get out there, whether you've ever started the martial arts or just started, or I'm going to be honest, whether you're, you've been doing them for years, uh, always keep a beginner's mind. Strive to learn. There's everyone out there who can learn from something from somebody else. I've learned things from my 13-year-old son. I've learned things from my 10-year-old son. Uh, it's it's we can learn from everybody, and if we keep remembering that and recognize we we don't know everything, I think this world could be a better place. Thank you for listening to episode 82 of Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Mr. Rowe. Head on over to WhistleKickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes, including links to everything we talked about today. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, like BMC1128 did in the intro section, remember we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, like iTunes, Stitcher, and all those, and if we find your review and mention it on the air, be sure to email us for your free box of WhistleKick stuff. If you haven't left us a review yet, please do help us out and leave one. Those reviews are a lot more important than you may realize. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that there too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of, and our username is always whistlekick. Every episode is also on YouTube, so check us out there if you have a chance. And remember the great products you can find over at whistlekick.com, and our sparring gear is on Amazon. That includes today's featured product, our sparring helmets. If you're a school owner or a team coach, you should really check out our wholesale program at wholesale.whistlekick.com, and that's where we offer some special pricing and all that to those of you that are buying in bulk. But that's all for us today. So until next time, train hard, smile and have a great day.